Good morning. Welcome to service today. Glad to have you here. As we are to seek him, celebrate him, and serve him. And him is Jesus Christ. Amen? We've got a few announcements. Let's just open our service with prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. And that's why we're here today, to love you back, to worship you. Be in this service. We invite you. We brought you in our hearts, and we worship you with our voices, our singing, our music, and uh, the word, and the prayer time today. All of these things are for Jesus, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get some quizzing reports. Yeah, we have a couple of announcements. Yeah. So yesterday, we had two different quiz meets that uh, youth and children in our church went to. So first, there was a children's quiz. Was that in Columbus? Down in Columbus. Uh, so there were five quizzes that went. You had Emma Hefner and Lucas Hefner, who both got bronze on the day. And then we had three golds on the day, which were uh, all three of the Shapers, Audrey, Bethany, and Caroline Shaper. And Caroline had one perfect round. So... There are pictures. Uh, and then for the teen quizzing, we were down uh, a little bit further south, uh, <laughs> down in Peter's Switch, uh, Church of the Nazarene. Uh, and we split into two teams. Uh, we had one team, which uh, consisted of uh, Gwen and Arthur McCullough, so two of her siblings, and Noah Hefner, who were second place on the day. So that was pretty good. <laughs> I'm not going to speak too much onto it, but they were, they were literally one question, 10 points away from first place. So it was really close. Uh, and then they had the quiz off for the St. Louis quiz, and uh, all three of her young siblings who participate uh, made the St. Louis quiz. So two on the A team, one on the B team. So. And Griffin was in the quiz off, so good job. All right. <laughs> If you guys will stand with us, we'll go ahead and get started with some praise this morning. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. The glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot Fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God 
Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's evil schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the dark forces, <laughs> against the dark forces and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms.
Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. Reminder for the uh, Zone Rally meeting tonight at Terre Haute first at 5 p.m., followed by a pitch-in dinner. Those of you who would like to go, Terre Haute first. And uh, also next Sunday we're eating, following the morning worship service. All right, Thanksgiving dinner.
And a reminder that we are in Romans chapter 12. Amen. Turn there as we continue our worship today in the Word of God. Just practical stuff. Verses uh, 10 and 11 today, we're just hitting these things. As we stand together, reading verses 10 and 11. Paul writing to the early Christians. Be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Bless your word again today, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Practical application of being a Christian can get messy. The early church probably had very little idea how to live out their faith. Imagine being a first century Christian, just brand new, trying to figure out this whole Christianity thing. You had to rely a lot on the disciples and what people said Jesus was saying and teaching and doing if you weren't a person who actually saw and heard Jesus. The issue was, as Paul left and became a missionary and went to all these different Gentile countries, Jesus' ministry was there, basically, in the Jewish lands. So how are these new churches out there supposed to know how to live? So we're grateful that Paul, inspired by God, gave us these insights, practical stuff. And we've been working our way through chapter 12, and I imagine that new Christians today aren't raised in the church, didn't have the traditions that you and I have as older Christians. Guess what happens to them when they become a Christian and they're like, um, how do you live this out? And even older Christians sometimes get stuck in their ways and need a reminder that maybe it's not about those ways. Maybe it's Paul's telling us we got to go all in. And some of those other things aren't as important as being where God wants me to be, doing what God wants me to do today. What's your place to, where's your place to be? What's your thing to do? Last week we looked at unhypocritical agape love. Verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Christians are to be genuine in unselfish love instead of putting on an act. That's what hypocrisy is about, acting. And then Paul began a list of bullet points as to what agape love looks like for the Christian in practical application today. And uh, the first two points were abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And that's what we talked about last week after we talked about agape, genuine love. So today we're looking at some more bullet points, and they continue, even past today. We'll be into this for a little bit. So uh, we're looking at a couple more uh, bullet bullet points of practical Christian agape love. What's it look like for Christians to have God's love flowing through them? You've got to abhor what is evil. You've got to cling to God and what is good. But then verse 10 Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. So the first part here is show affectionate preference. This verse, the first part has two compound verbs or words, kindly affectionate, brotherly love. And both of these have the idea of family. The compound words, are, and both are family. Other brotherly, you can see it, but the other one is family, affectionate. Uh, So kindly, affectionate, brotherly love. Uh, The first means family affection. The second is a Greek word actually 
that uh, we would say in English, Philadelphia. That's the city of brotherly love, named after the Greek word, Philadelphia. Compound word, brother, love. Okay. Uh, so, I hate to say it, but when we talk about brotherly love, family connection love, and apply it to the church, we have issues today. We're living in a day when the concept of family love is hard to grasp for many people. The idea of your father being married to your mother and living together until death is almost a foreign concept today. Majority of adults today in America are not married. Think about that. I remember the day when we used to talk about it. Well, we're still more married couples than not. The concept of a caring, loving relationship of family members in a home and a supportive network of extended family that you all older folks grew up with is no longer the norm. These are not the experiences of many people today. So when we start talking about family, love, and affection, well, let's take it a little bit further. So if you're talking about our Father in heaven or a heavenly Father, guess how that messes up with today's society? Is that the kind of God that we use those terms? It's biblical terms, but they don't work anymore for people who grew up without a dad or grew up with an abusive dad. Is that how we want our Heavenly Father to be? Or grew up with a non-involved? He just kind of hovering out there somewhere. Someone I was talking to recently talked about how their career came before their family. And they were always gone. And it hurt the relationship with their spouse and the relationship with their children. Some growing up today don't even know who their dad is. What is family love when mom is strung out on drugs and dad has never been in the picture and grandparents are now carrying the load? Today, millions of children in the United States are being raised by their grandparents or parents, literally. Check at the school next door. Over 600,000 children today are in the foster care systems in America. They will never have a typical home that you grew up with. Needless to say, Paul wrote about family love and family care. He had a different culture in mind than what many are experiencing today in our modern world. So we talk about family love, and I grew up where we were brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. We had all that concept, and everybody in the church was that way. But it's not that way anymore. Maybe it still is mostly in the church. But when you have an outsider come in, guess what? They don't understand family love. And this pause to say some of that family love that we tout so high probably wasn't all that great either. Because there's some Christians that hide behind the facade on Sunday, but back home it was right? You can hide a whole lot of stuff when you look so good on Sunday. When you get dressed to come to church and you can put on that holy family look. I'm just glad there is so much of it that is still there for us to understand. But the lever to beaver, leave it to beaver culture is where today?
And probably half of you don't even know what Libra is. If you talk about it today, society. So with this as background, I understand that we're having a tough time with this verse in today's culture. You start quoting this to, this is how the church is supposed to look. Family love. This is how we get along. But Paul used that as an example of how Christians are to treat each other in the body of Christ. We are to love each other like that kind of a family. How does family affection develop? If you want a family that stays together, it prays together. As one of the saints used to say, family that prays together stays together. But family affection is more than just going to Disney World. Never been, probably never will go. It's more than just fun times. The family that gets together and has affection one to another, they spend time together. They work together. Yes, our girls hated it, but we raked leaves together. They would try to find excuses on reek late, week, yeah, raking day. Oh, they hated it. Uh, it means washing dishes. That's together time. That's helping out time. It means cleaning your rooms. It means shoveling snow. It means folding clothes. Learning affection means, in your family, winning games and losing games and learning how to do both. It means celebrating the holidays together. It means going to practices and rehearsals. Oh, somebody was telling me they had to limit their kids to two activities a week. Only two clubs, only two groups, because there's so much. I remember setting those hours at the ballpark, practices, then the games. Your whole life is being ruined by something she gave up next year. On to the next thing. But they dressed in those cute matching outfits, and you put, a, you put a bow that matched in their ponytail. It was so cute. I wasted three years of my life for that. They outgrew the cute stage, and then it became work. Because then they really wanted you to learn how to hit. Anyway. Growing as a family is sharing griefs. Right? You gotta work through those together. It's sharing laughs. It's it's waiting for your turn for the bathroom. If that's how families do it, how do Christians grow in affection and love for each other? How do the body of Christ do that? It's, it's a lot of similarities, right? Well, if you're new, there's the initial welcome of the first-time visitors. They show up, you know, and and they get greeted, and they get the odd looks from across the sanctuary. Somebody you know. Or do they get, hey, I'm so-and-so, Pastor Betts, how are you? Some of that's kind of important. I know what happens when we have a new member in the family. Everybody shows up, right? If there's a baby born, (laughs) Then, after that initial, how do you get people in the family? Sharing concerns, learning to support each other in prayer, small group experiences, grow those initial into a family member. It's part of the process. It's what we need to be doing and helping to to see that it takes place. But there's another deeper level, and that is when we get involved together working in a ministry or on a project, taking it to a deeper level. We talked about Bert and, 
and Ray a couple of Sundays ago. That's so important. He knew, he knew he needed to bring him in. He was hurting after his wife died. And so there, there's something to be said about helping alongside someone else that draws you closer together. You know what? You can visit a shut-in together. Right? You can clean up a room together. You can pray about a problem together. You can repl- uh, replace a fixture together on another project. You can give something to a brother or sister in need, and then you guys are together on something because they had a need. You help to fill it. That brings you together. That's affectionate family love. These are the things that make a Christian family. But the second part of the verse shows how the family affection becomes a reality. This is the hard part. This is maybe one of the hardest verses in the Bible, that section. Because you don't get this anywhere else. In honor giving preference to one another. You ever heard that before? When one Christian shows preference to another Christian, that is family affection becoming a reality. It's hard to do, even in your own family. Give preference to that ratty sister. Give preference to that bossy brother. Just face it, because some people get very tired of being around a braggart. The preference is always about me. That kind of a person. But people love being around someone who says, hey, you did a good job. Hey, I care about you. Hey, good to see you. Hey, want to do something together? Hey, I'm going to do this for you. And all of a sudden, the worm the one giving preference to somebody else makes that somebody else feel like, hey, I'm preferred. I'm noticed. I am cared for. And this screams directly against everything you hear out in the world. We have a celebrity culture. And everybody wants to be the celebrity, even of third grade. They want to be the person who gets all the attention and all the notice. Because we've been briefed on that. We've been pushed on that. Everything is about, we know these famous names. Give preference to them. They're a senator. She's on the Grammys. He's a football player. Someone suggested that church people should try to outdo one another in showing honor and respect. I read this, and I was like, what? Isn't that what Paul said? Would this be a cool thing? If everyone in this church began to do that, I want to outdo Elissa, I want to outdo Ian. I want to outdo Bill in honoring someone else. I don't know if that's the right kind of competition, but it sounds fun. I have a contest to see who can do more for somebody else and love on someone else more. Can you imagine a church where everyone is constantly trying to find ways to encourage and build up someone else who attends? When word got around, I believe that place, that church would become packed. That's the church where everyone looks out for everyone else. Where everyone else is preferred above themselves. Interestingly, that's how the early church grew. Read the book of Acts. Everyone showed affection. Everyone was showing preference to someone else. 
I wonder, oh, they acted like Jesus. They were the early, that's all they knew. That's all the disciples knew. That's what the 120 knew. That's all the early church knew, is that you act like Jesus, which is, oh, how are you doing today? Can I help you with that? Can I give you, can I? Well, there's a need. Silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I love you, sister, and I love your brother. We have a need in the church. Okay, I'm going to sell this property. I'm going to bring the money. I want to meet that need. They acted like Jesus. And the church exploded, literally. They couldn't count as many as kept coming to Christ. Maybe that sounds like idealism. There's a lot about Christianity that sounds like idealism when it's being preached. But Jesus did it. The disciples did it. The early church did it. Imagine a place where harmony and encouragement are the norm, where everyone shares the ministry load, where prayers go up daily for each other. Can a church become a family? Wouldn't it be a great experience for someone who never had a true family growing up to show up at our church and experience family? They didn't know about a heavenly father, but they can get a big father here. Never knew about brothers and sisters, but they can get it here. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what God wants? In honor, preferring one another, to give preference to one another. Maybe we should just pause here for a moment. I finished the sermon on Thursday. It was mowing, mulching leaves on Friday. I was trying to keep my golf course appearance that my neighbor John is worried about. But it's got leaves on it again. But man, I got to keep ahead. He's got one of these high powered machines nowadays, and it's hard to keep up with him. And while I was mowing, the thought came to me what if we stopped the service, put it on pause? And everyone in this church sanctuary this morning would turn and pray in their minds for someone else in this church and pray a prayer of blessing. God bless so-and-so with encouragement today with a financial blessing. Before the end of the year, give them a financial blessing, Lord. Does anybody here do some financial blessings? Christmas is coming. The winter bills are coming. Wouldn't it be just cool if we could just pause for a moment and pray for someone else in honor, in preference? Because we pray for ourselves. 90% of your prayer requests is about you and your family, right? Right? I got to get through this day. Lord, I got to get the sermon done. Lord, my girls need your help. And my grandkids, if they go to school. And I, right? And we pray down the list of the stuff that we know about. But what about preference in prayer once in a while for someone else? Where it doesn't come back to you, but the blessing goes to them and you never even know about it. That's a pretty cool concept. Isn't that what he's saying? So let's pause for a moment. You find someone, even if you're online, find someone in your mind to pray about a blessing on them. And Lord, we just bow, bow our heads right now and pause in the middle of this sermon to say, Lord, would you please put a financial blessing on so-and-so? Lord, would you please send encouragement? You know the one who's down right now. 
Lord, may they just know that God is looking at their lives and he cares about them today. Lord, we as a church want to prefer someone else in this prayer. Honor them, lift them up, encourage them, help them, strengthen them, heal them. They're hurting. Maybe they're being disrespected at work. Maybe, Lord, they're not being uh, taken care of well at home. Whatever the case may be, God, you bring the blessing right now into their lives. And you add your little thoughts because you're praying about a specific person or family. And so, Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Giving preference to one another. Prayer is just the tip of the iceberg of what you can do. But it certainly is a good beginning. Paul wrote that practical Christianity involves showing affection and preference to a Christian family member. Then he wrote, serve with diligence and fervency. Verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The problem with the family concept is that sometimes the harmony stops when it comes to getting to work, when it comes to serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence could be translated, don't shrink from eagerness, or don't be lazy when it comes to your earnestness. Have some passion, follow it through, get the job done, be diligent, be earnest, be eager. Having passion to serve the Lord doesn't come automatically. You have to work at it. Day after day sometimes, week after week. Ministry, maybe this is a new revelation to you, but ministry is a cycle that keeps repeating itself. Ask the praise team. Come in and practice every week. They practice again on Sunday morning in order to minister to you. Thank the Lord for our praise band. But it's a cycle that keeps repeating itself. If you're in regular ministry, you'll know this to be true. It is a cycle. You prepare for your ministry, Sunday school lesson, whatever it is, making biscuits, you know, Whatever the ministry is, preparing the lesson for we worship, for children's church, teens, you prepare for your ministry, somewhere in the week you get excited about that lesson or, or that serving or that helping, uh, someone that you've been praying for and you're looking forward to it, that they will, you've invited them, they will be here, you're, you're praying, you're working, you're doing the job, that ministry Ready to go. This is what we're, Sunday's coming, if that's the ministry day. Maybe Wednesday's coming, or maybe something else. Thursday night, ladies' Bible study, teen quizzing. You're getting ready for that ministry. And then you show up, and while serving, you pour out your soul. You pour out your heart. You give it all you've got. You're praying, you're working, you're sharing. And then, whew, it's over. Good job. You did a great job on that. Thank you. All right. And then, you're tired. So what do you do? Sunday's coming. You turn back to God. You get back to the Word. You get back to you in your prayer, you figure it out again, because you got to do that ministry all over again. It's a cycle. It happens again and again. You get built back up. You do it one more time. And the next time you show up to serve, <laughs> something negative happens. It isn't every week that everything is all positive. Something negative happens. Someone's going to gripe somewhere in your ministry. Two people are going to get in an argument. I mean, it's going to happen. 
sooner or later. We don't like the way things are going around here. <laughs> and you're trying, you're doing ministry and whatever. And then the person you've been praying for, the one that God's laid on your heart, they don't even show up. And so the, the night ends, the service is over, whatever, and you go, okay, Lord, I'm done. This is about as real as it gets, my friends. It is so real. And the devil's on your shoulder. They don't like you. They don't care about what you're doing. You see, we would rather fuss and carry on our thing than to pray for the ones that are feeding our souls. We all got our little pet things that are so important. Someone gripes, somebody gets in an argument, and the children, I don't know what they were going to fed that morning, but man, they did not sit down, they did not listen, they did not pay attention. They, why, why am I here? My box of donuts didn't even do it. I mean, they were nuts. Ever had that happen? They put me in charge of children for a caravan program at one church. Oh, my word. Debbie, help. I don't know how to handle ankle biters. I am sorry. I just, whew, not my thing. God, get me out of here. But they had a spot to be filled, and I was a Seminary student, for good enough sakes. I could quote him the Greek, but I couldn't get him to calm down. Wrong person, wrong job. So you're ready to quit, but God won't let you. Maybe I'm stalling too long on this, but if you've been in ministry at any time, you know what this is right. Somewhere in it, you're going to feel that. It's going to happen to you. <laughs> God says, no. You've got a call. I put this on your heart. And so he gives you a promise from his word. He sends someone to you get a text. You get, well, maybe I did touch someone. Sometimes it's the worst sermons that I feel like I've been a total failure, and someone will come up to me later in the week and say, you know what, that sermon was just for me. And I was like, that was the worst flop of a sermon I ever preached in my life. You see, it's not what I said, it's what God applied to someone's heart and life. And what are we saying about the ministry of the Spirit? Certainly when I struggle, he doesn't. Wow. And so he reminds you of the call. He gives you a little encouragement. Somebody comes along. He's got a way of pride. So if God tells you during the week, why don't you talk to somebody and encourage them, somebody who's leading, somebody who's helping, why don't you do it? Because guess what? It may be the reason why they stick it out another month. Because the devil told them to quit. Can I tell you how many times in my ministry I was ready to quit? It happens to all pastors. A current statistic that I heard this week is that out of 10 pastors who start out pastoring, only one will make it to retirement. That's the current statistic. 10 who start, why? They can make more money. I was thinking, you realize the skills that it takes to be a pastor? There's a lot of companies that would like those kind of skills. Trying to help and get along with people. I do organizational, whatever. God has gifted leadership, et cetera, in so many different ways that the corporate world is just looking for somebody. And you probably get less trouble being a greeter at Walmart than you do being a pastor of a church. 
You just hand them a cart and greet them and say, hey, how you doing? And they move on. See, Paul knew this feeling. Where is Paul when he writes half his letters? Well, the devil, hey, you're doing a good job there, Paul. How many churches you opened up this year? <laughs> good job, Paul. You're a total failure. Loser. Double loser. That's outdated, isn't it? That's what my kids used to do. They're grown and gone. That's outdated, I'm sure. But he sat there in that jail, and God would say, you know, write a letter. Encourage that church. You can't be there, but you can encourage them. He sat down. We've got some of his letters. I think he had a super ministry, and I'm so grateful for that ministry. But you know the devil jumping on him. And then God say, witness to that jailer. <laughs> okay. God gave him inspiration of what to write to encourage one of the churches, and he got back to work serving the Lord. My friends, should we not also continue our ministry task with that kind of persistence and enthusiasm? You'll have to get some sleep. You will need to spend time in prayer. You will need encouragement from God's word. You'll need encouragement from a Christian friend. You will have to get over your discouragements. And the devil will tell you to give up, but through faith, determination, and willpower, you can do what God has called you and gifted you to do. That's why you're here. Every Christian has a gift and an obligation under God. And you've got to keep doing it until God gives you something else. Work in the kingdom. And the next phrase is the secret to rebuilding your earnestness, your eagerness, your diligence to serve Jesus. Paul wrote the phrase, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Serving the Lord, it comes with both. <laughs> the Greek word for fervent is boiling. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Bubbling. Some of those people just have that personality. Others of us have to work on it. Remember the old steam locomotive? Ain't going nowhere. You don't get the boiler going. Got to get that water steamed up. What's that take? Some fire underneath. Getting that thing going, which means you got to throw the coal in, build the fire, feed the fire, because you want to get the boiling so you can have ministry, so you can have movement. Some just get into going enough to toot their whistle. Toot, toot. But if the gears are going to go, if the wheels are going to turn, fervent in spirit. It takes God's spirit to fire up our spirits. For ministry. Some argue whether this is supposed to be capital S spirit or small. It doesn't matter. It takes God's spirit to get your spirit. It's both. You got to have the fervent in spirit, but God's the one who gives you the fervent in spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Is your passion dying down? Is your persistence lagging? Then pray like every other passionate worker does, for a fresh empowerment for God, for the task at hand, because I need God's empowerment every week. And somewhere about Monday, I'm ready to quit, but somewhere around Thursday, I'm ready to go again, because there is a God who boils me with his fire and says, do it again. And I say, yes, I will. If I need it every week, so do you. I've got to go to that place of appointment where there's three other Christians amongst how many other people. And thank you, Lord, for those three. The Lord, build us up. 
because the pressure is going to be on. And we got to let the light shine for Jesus Christ. So you better spend some time through the Spirit to get your spirit going. This is the secret as to why one out of ten pastors will stick it out to retirement. This is the secret for teachers and leaders who give out for God week after week after week. Tired after serving, they get back into the presence of God and beg him, help us, strengthen me, encourage me. I've got to face the five-year-olds again. I've got to preach to that. I've got to teach. I've got to help the teens. I've got to lead this group. I've got to clean the church. I've got to call on my neighbor. I need to go to the nursing home this week. I need to bake something and give it to somebody. God says, you can do it. My spirit is enough. Tired after serving, they get back into the presence of God, beg him to strengthen and inspire them to serve again. Think about it. What makes you fervent in spirit? Why do we serve God week after week? What is the reason behind your earnestness, your passion, your diligence? What makes you fervent? For many, it's their heritage. For some, it's tradition. But I think of the word heritage because you know that other Christians are counting on you to be faithful. We're body of Christ. What if we didn't show up and do our part? But the heritage thing is, there's this great cloud of witnesses the Bible talks about who need you to be faithful to serve the present generation. There won't be a cloud of witnesses for this generation if we don't serve. Got to. Do you even know who teaches the children's Sunday school class? There's two of them. Or the youth class. Do we even know? Do we even pray for them? What motivates you? Maybe it's the fight against Satan and evil that motivates you. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Maybe that motivates you. Maybe it's the reality that time is running out. Does that motivate you? Maybe you feel the burden of people that you know who are facing eternity without God. Maybe that motivates you to keep ministering, keep going. And those are all good motivations for ministry. I got them out of a book. I also got them out of practical experience, but they said something that surprised me then after those motivations. They said, but here's the real reason. Real reason is because I love Jesus. Sometimes when all the other motivations, you just have to remind yourself, I'm going to do this for Jesus' sake. I'm doing this for Jesus' sake. When you walk into that hospital room or that nursing home room, I'm doing this for Jesus. When you stay up half the night preparing another lesson, and it just ain't coming, but you got to get it done. I'm doing this for Jesus' sake. They're counting on me. I've got to do it. When you clean up the mess that someone else left in the bathroom. I did one today. I'm doing this for Jesus. When the way gets lonely and the work gets hard and the devil's riding your back and digging you with his spurs, remind yourself, I'm doing this for Jesus. Jesus died for me. 
and I will always live to serve him. If you get your eyes on someone else, you're going to see that they aren't pulling their load. But when you look at Jesus, you're going to see you're not pulling your load. He said, get in the yoke with me. It fits perfectly. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. We get into this comparison thing, well, I'm doing okay because they're not doing anything. I'm doing more than they. No. Your motivation is Jesus. That's got to be the motivation. My brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever God has gifted you to do in the kingdom of God and in this church, do it with agape love. Without hypocrisy, without putting on an act. Do it with diligence. Do it with fervency. Do it with patience. Do it with a smile, a glow, a kindness, an attitude to hold your head high as you walk into that mess, that place of ministry, because you are a servant of Jesus Christ. You are not lagging in diligence, but you are fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. God, help us to keep going. That's what he's called us to do. For Jesus' sake. The greatest symbol for Jesus Christ is the cross. It's the greatest symbol. No doubt about it. But the next greatest symbol, perhaps, for Jesus is the towel. The night before he was to die, Jesus took the towel in the basin of water and washed stinky, dirty feet. The king of kings, the creator of the universe, did what no one else in that room was low enough to do, be the servant. Jesus used the towel to show his unhypocritical agape love. He used the towel to show his brotherly affection. His brotherly love that he honored them, that he gave preference to them. Those are words Paul used here, with preference. Jesus used the towel to show his passion for ministry. His earnestness to work. That he had a fire in his belly, to made him boil fervency and spirit to serve the Lord, to do what God needed to be, have done, regardless of the task. He was willing to do it. So we look at the cross, yes. But sometimes you need to look at the towel, because that's more where we live. I've heard the stories about Jesse Pitts and Booty Wet Knight and Bert Hyde and Carol Latham and many others who worked hard in serving the Lord in this church. And there's many others. I just four that popped in my mind and I said, that's enough. <laughs> because there's many others. Now it's our turn. Paul says this is practical Christianity. You got to go all in. It's not going to happen unless you do your part for the kingdom of God. And it's not even about you or about me. It is about your love for Jesus. That's what it's about. How much do we love Jesus? Is it enough to use our gifts that he's gifted us with? Because we are serving for Jesus' sake. Not for pastor's sake, not for guilt's sake, for Jesus' sake. Start carrying a cross in one pocket and a towel in the other pocket and see what God's calling you to do. Serving the Lord. Wow. Kindly affectionate, brotherly love, honor-giving preference, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, Serving the Lord, I can't wait till next week. 
because he's getting into our business. He's getting into our business. Come on, Paul, write something else. But this is the church, he's saying. This is what we got to do. Because of what Christ did. Praise team's coming. Let's go to family altar time. Talk to the Lord about whatever's on your heart this morning. Whatever's bothering you, whatever you need to give to him. So, Lord, we pause at this crucial moment in the service. We're preaching to the church, not preaching to sinners, but they can certainly come and jump in and experience this God kind of spirit for themselves. You're calling all of us, wherever we are, to step up a game, to get in on the team, to get off the bench, get out of the fringes, to get into the battle, to do our part for Jesus' sake. It's not about anything else, but it's the love for Jesus Christ. It compels me, as Paul wrote in another, it compels me. So Lord, today, light a fire within us, we pray. Help us to feed that fire. Help us, Lord, to be honest and open and willing because you want to do something in us and through us. Do it in us so that you can do it through us. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Come and minister to us right now. In Jesus' name we pray.
Lord, we continue our time of prayer just thanking you that you are calling, that you're equipping, that you're giving us the, the fervency we need. You build us up week after week. Lord, do what you're calling us to do. I pray that you will strengthen the feeble hands that are lagging and, and encourage those weak knees, Lord. Make them strong. Give us, give us Lord, the energy that we need to keep marching to Zion in a day in which everybody seems to be running in the opposite direction, scared to be a Christian. Lord, help us to stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free. Don't let us be entangled with the yoke of bondage. But Lord, whom the sun sets free, he's free indeed, free to do God's will. Set the prisoner free today. Lord, set the bound up Christian free today kick the devil out of our lives and out of our homes, out of our schools, out of our community, Lord. Free us up, Lord, to be the man, the woman, the child of God that you've called us to be. And Lord, when you lay something on our hearts, help us to get it done. Help us to get it done, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we are here to seek you. We're here to seek you. We're here to worship you. We're here to serve you. Thank you, Lord. And for that one online right now that needs your touch, Lord, minister to them right now. Encourage them. Oh, I can't do nothing anymore. Help them, Lord, to know what they can do. Who can they encourage? Who can they help? Who can they pray for? Lord, give us all a task this week. And Lord, help us to carry it out. We're doing it because we love Jesus. Lord, not out of guilt, but because we love you. We want to do something good for someone in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time. Now help us as we continue our worship in this service. Thank you for our praise team. Bless them and encourage them. Thank you for our faithful people. Bless them, encourage them. Thank you for our veterans. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Bless and encourage that veteran that needs it today. Lord, they gave, and now you're giving to them. Thank you, Lord. You are helping. You are encouraging. You are strengthening. Every day, Lord, you build us up so that we can build others up. That's what the family of God does. Lord, we're a body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters. Help us to treat each other with preference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. You're my strength when I am weak. You're the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, the Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, the Lamb Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my
All right, we have one more song for you guys to dismiss you. And I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. And I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And I'm trading my sickness. For the joy of the Lord. And we say, Yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord. Amen. Well, I'm pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure. His joy is going to be my strength. And though the sorrow may last for the night, His joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrow. joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. And I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And we sing, yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes. Yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, your, yes, yes, the Lord, amen. We all sing, yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, the Lord, yes, yes, the Lord, amen. God bless you guys. We will see you all next week.